for today's webinar. Today is the 95th national webinar organized by the Believers Webinars and Clinics Committee. Today we have done it with the Association of Department of Pulmonology. The moderator for today is Dr. Luke Matthew. Sir, that is MBBS from Trivandrum Medical College, MD from CMC Ludhiana, later went to UK, worked with the NHS, and it is MRCP, and worked as a consultant in Walsall Manor Hospital, and headed the Department of Respiratory Medicine for the government of Brunei. And he joined our Believers family in June 2016, over to you, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. It's a privilege to be able to talk to all of you this evening. Today, um, <clears throat> we are talking about a very important uh, topic, and namely, that is pulmonary infections in the immunocompromised patient. This is a very important topic because if you look at it, we are increasingly seeing a large number of patients who are immunocompromised. And I would add to say that immunocompromise is as a result of the progress in medical science. It is the price of progress. Now you may ask me, how can it be the price of progress? If you look at it, people are living to become older you have patients who have diabetes who are being treated and living longer than what their predecessors with the same disease did. Patients with renal failure who have dialysis almost have a normal life. Patients with uh, hematological malignancies have bone marrow transplants and they again live a long life. Similarly, those with uh, solid organ transplants and HIV patients, and all these patients live longer, and the price of living longer is that they also become immunocompromised. So in the hospital milieu that we deal with now, we see patients who have had transplant who come in with infections or other symptoms within the x-ray, which we have to discern as to what their cause is. When I speak of uh, immunocompromised patients, remember, they are people who are like anyone else and are susceptible to all the infections that an immunocompetent person can get. But in addition, they have the propensity of developing infections from otherwise non-virulent organisms. And that is what we are talking about mainly today, but it will include the whole gamut of infections that affect these patients. Mm -hmm. This is an important topic because it is clinically topical. Additionally, for the students who are now joining us in this program, I would say that it is an important topic for all postgraduate exams. The NEET exams have questions that come from the uh, the, the preview of uh, the immunocompromised patient. So it is important for people to know about this to improve clinical practice and to also to improve their knowledge base. We are privileged this evening to have with us Dr. Aji Matthew Joseph, who is the uh, Associate Professor of Pulmonology at the Believers Church Medical College. Ladies and gentlemen, with your permission, may I ask Dr. Aji to take over. Dr. Aji. Thank you, sir. So very good evening to you all. Uh, I'll be talking on pulmonary infections in the immune compromised host. Uh, so as clinicians, we often come across immune compromised patients in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, they do present with uh, uh, systemic complications and more often we see respiratory complications in such patients uh, purely manifesting as uh, respiratory infections or pneumonia. So uh, the uh, information regarding the pulmonary infections in such patients is vital uh, 
from the point of view that these infections are easily missed. Uh, this is because most of these patients we see, they are asymptomatic or they do have non-specific symptoms in the beginning. And uh, most of these uh, patients' infections are being diagnosed uh, radiologically as uh, part of a screening chest X-ray or, or even a CT scan. So the correct and apt diagnosis of such infections in these immune compromised patients is vital so as to uh, rightly uh, start the correct microbicidal agents for such patients uh, to salvage them from these infections uh, to sink them down. So a, 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 an in-depth knowledge regarding these infections in immune compromised patients would be uh, beneficial uh, in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So I'll be focusing on this topic, uh, uh, introducing you all to the commonest immune def defects and then the pulmonary infections in immune compromised patients. Uh, I'll be focusing based on the major five immune deficit uh, status that we come across in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So this will be focused as uh, hematological malignancies, uh, our patients uh, who had uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, uh, patients with the post-lung transplant status, uh, patients with HIV uh, AIDS infection, solid organ transplant patients, connective tissue disease patients who are on biologics or uh, immunosuppressive therapies, and a brief slide regarding the management algorithm for such patients who are expected to have pulmonary infection uh, and a few slides to summarize the whole talk. So moving on, uh, we know that pulmonary infections uh, are common among the most common type of tissue infections in immune compromised patients. But then uh, when you consider the whole pulmonary complications, approximately 75% of these complications are called for respiratory infection. So globally, we do see a rise in the immune compromised patients uh, that is largely by the greater use of immunosuppressive therapy for malignancies, autoimmune disorders, connective tissue disorders, and also in post-transplant patients where you want to uh, bring down or treat the rejection. Uh, in developing countries, we do see a rise in uh, people living with HIV AIDS. These groups also contribute to the uh, above-mentioned immune compromised patient group. And also you can have immune defect uh, either because it's a congenital immune defect or as a result of certain malignancies like uh, hematological malignancies, uh, you can have your immunity suppressed. So when you have uh, any kind of uh, infectious suspicion in such patients, the earliest and the easiest mode of uh, screening tool would be a chest, chest X-ray. Uh, but then these chest X-rays have got its own limitations, uh, which are usually negated by uh, contrast resolution CT scan. But then the clinical data along with the radiological data should be supported by microbiologic confirmation of the most suspicious organism so as to rightly initiate the microbicidal agent and that so that you can salvage the patient from uh, worsening of the clinical scenario. Now the commonest immune defect that you usually see uh, this could be either primary congenital or acquired, uh, that is phagocytosis defects, humoral or antibody immune defects, patients with cell mediated immune defects, patients with complement system defects, and you have patients who are immunodeficient either due to splenectomy or hyposplenism. Now, different immune defects have got an association to specific infectious organisms. So, as you see here, uh, you have a T cell defect or you have patients who are on long-term corticosteroid therapy. They are mostly prone for bacterial, viral, fungal, and also parasitic infections. As in this slide, I'm not going to each of them. As against those patients who are post splenectomy or with a T cell defect, they are mostly prone for uh, bacterial pneumonia. Now coming to the first status of immunodeficiency, this deficiency that is patients with the hematological malignancy or those patients with the hematological uh, stem cell transplant. We know these malignancies by themselves or by a consequence of their management uh, by chemotherapy, radiotherapy or even transplant or even a combination of these can suppress the immunity of these patients and thus making them at high risk for infection. So the pulmonary infection or the respiratory tract infection continues to be 
నైజ మొబిలిటీ అండ్ మోర్టాలిటీకి వస్తుంది స్పేషల్ now the patients infected during uh, hematological malignancy is a post transplant status there is a timeline for infection so we de uh, we uh, define this timeline into three that is the pre engraftment period that is during the first 30 days of transplant the early post transplant period that is from one month up to 100 days of transplant and late post transplant period that is a transplant period beyond 100 days now we know hematological malignancy so post stem cell transplant there is an immediate neutropenia associated and this is the primary risk factor for the uh, uh, the risk factor for developing infection during the pre engraftment period or during the first 30 days so in this first 30 days bacterial pneumonias are usually uh, uncommon considering the fact that uh, the widespread use of broad spectrum antibiotics even at a subtle uh, signs of clinical signs of infection so usually we see a rise in fungal pneumonia which account for 25 to 50% of all pneumonias and among these fungal pneumonias aspergillus is the commonest culprit during this uh, pre engraftment period it can either manifest as angio invasive or an airway invasive disease now uh, coming to this is a ct picture of a patient with acute myelogenous leukemia with an angio invasive aspergillosis you can see there is an area of the focal nodular consolidation with surrounding ground glass opacity and uh, as manifest as uh, mentioned as the ct halo sign now coming to the second uh, period that is the early post transplant period when you have infections occurring between between uh, days uh, 31 to 100 or after first month so during this period you have commonly fungal and viral pneumonias mostly aspergillosis and cytomegalovirus so the incidence of these infections are found to be higher in allogenic stem cell transplant as against uh, less than 2% in autologous stem cell transplant. So the uh, CMV infection can occur either due to the reactivation of a latent virus infection during this time of profound immunosuppression, or it could also be due to infusion of uh, seropositive marrow or blood product to a seronegative recipient. Now, uh, pneumocystis virovacy pneumonia infections are now on a uh, 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 low because of the widespread use of prophylaxis. It's being commonly seen in those patients who are out of this prophylactic uh, regimen. Now, idiopathic pneumonia syndrome is again another entity that needs to be considered during this uh, early post transplant period. That is actually a, a diagnosis of exposure where you can, you can have widespread damage of your alveoli in the absence of a lower respiratory tract infection. The pathology of this idiopathic pneumonia syndrome remains poorly understood, but even then it's usually related to drug toxicity associated with the uh, malignancy, or it could also be a feature of an undiagnosed infection or due to a graft versus host disease. So that is also to be considered in this period. This is a CT picture of a patient with a stem cell transplant and a CMV pneumonia. You can see widespread extensive pores, ground glass densities bilaterally along with the uh, subtle thickening. So the third uh, entity is the late post-transplant period where you have infections occurring beyond 100 days. So pulmonary complications are usually reduced during this, this period of, of the uh, recovery of the humoral and the cell-mediated immunity post-100 days. But then uh, about half of the patients with allogenic stem cell transplant, you often uh, come across a graft versus host disease occurring during this period and these people are at increased risk of infection either due to the direct inhibition of the immune system or it could also be a sequence of the high dose of uh, immunosuppression that you give to treat the graft versus host disease so this makes these people prone for bacterial viral or even fungal infection commonly we see aspergillus cytomycetes adeno respiratory syncytial virus varicella virus and para influenza during this period now, this is again the uh, CT film of a patient with allogenic stem cell transplant with uh, para influenza infection. You can see widespread diffuse nodular opacities with the uh, pre invert pattern, and there is a large conglomerated nodule seen along the right lower lobe. Now, coming to the uh, second group of patients, uh, that is the post lung transplant patient. The pulmonary infection is the most common complication following lung transplant. 
And why do we see such common uh, infections in these patients? Is it because don't put on right here. I said not to put on right here. Nonsense! I told you not to put on. Yeah, this is because of the increased uh, uh, immunosuppression, uh, an impairment of the cough reflex. In fact, we could see very clear that could again cause pileup of the secretion and make them prone for uh, pneumonia. Altered phagocytosis of the macro macrophages, interrupted lymphatic drainage, and also due to the direct communication of the lungs with the atmosphere, that makes them prone for the uh, infection with bacteria, virus, and fungus, fungus in the atmosphere. The bacterial pneumonias are the most common cause of infection in lung transplant patient. Its highest incidence is during the first month. The 75 percent of these lung transplant patients develop pneumonia within the first three months. Commonest organisms are gram-negative bacteria like Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, and Enterobacter coeta. You can even have Staph aureus infection also. So these patients with the patient with the post lung transplant with the Pseudomonas infection, you can see widespread nodular consolidation. In the background of peripheral nodular lesions, viral pneumonia (CMV) remains the most commonest virus causing viral pneumonia, accounting for about 50% of these patients. It could occur either as a as a primary infection, that is, a seropositive donor uh, being transplanted to uh, a seronegative recipient, or it can also occur as a secondary infection where the patient is being exposed to a new CMV strain, or due to the reactivation of the latent infection during this immuno, uh, increased immunosuppressive phase. This commonly occurs after one month, up to four months of transplant. And uh, CME infections uh, can have uh, superimposed bacterial or other fungal infections. Or also, and also these patients are at risk of developing a bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, where you can have a permanent irreversible scarring, eosinophilic scarring of the small airway. And uh, this is, in fact, a feature or a manifestation of the uh, allograft rejection. A chronic allograft rejection is a manifestation that is usually a late transplant manifestation occurring after period of six months. And 50% of lung transplant patients do de develop this rejection uh, by five years. So other viruses involved are herpes simplex virus, adeno, respiratory syncytial virus, influenza, and para-influenza virus. So this is again a lung transplant recipient with the cytomegalovirus pneumonia. It can have functional granular specificity, a nodular consolidation on the uh, right side. Fungal pneumonias are usually uh, uh, less common compared to viral pneumonias post transplant, but they can, but then again, uh, they can cause serious uh, mortality if you get infected with them. So candida and aspergillus are the usually uh, usual culprits. The infection is usually between 10th day and 60 days post transplant. So, aspergillus can manifest either as a in locally invasive or as a disseminated infection, and uh, it can cause up to 4 to 7 percent of all lung transplant deaths. So, aspergillus can, can cause intolerant pneumonia or permanent angio invasive infection with a systemic dissemination. Another manifestation of aspergillus infection in post lung transplant patient is. Where you can have ulcerative tracheal bronchitis, and that this could be uh, radiographically occult, and that can result in bronchial anastomotic dehiscence. So that should be uh, kept in our mind. So this is a CT of a lung transplant recipient with aspergillus bronchiolitis. You can see there is white, a widespread uh, uh, nodular uh, centilobular nodules with bronchial airway dilatation. So there is a low attenuation seen here. This is because of the chronic rejection and there is air traffic. So in short, uh, lung transplant and recipient infection can be bacterial, viral or fungal. First 30 days you are more prone, prone for the bacterial infections like Lepsiella, Pseudomonas and even Staph aureus. Coming to the first month until the four months you have viral infections and in the later stage of uh, uh, 10 days to 60 days you can have uh, fungal infection. Now coming to the third modality of patient, this is a patient that's infected with HIV AIDS. So globally, we do see a rise in people living with HIV AIDS, partly because of the continued spread of the disease and also because of the uh, proper treatment they are getting. So uh, respiratory tract remain one of the commonest sites of infection. And HIV patients, 70% of them 
do have a pulmonary complication and this is mostly pulmonary infection. Now, during the, uh, due to the introduction of uh, PCP prophylaxis and heart, that is highly active endoproviral therapy, we do see a, a, a low prevalence or low incidence of pneumocystis gerulosa pneumonia among patients with uh, infected with HIV. But even then, this remains the most uh, age-defining disease or opportunistic infection in the developing countries. Now, for uh, HIV patients to have infection with any microorganism, there are three risk factors associated. The first one would be the degree of immunosuppression that would be based mainly on their CD4 uh, count. The second thing would be the patient's demographic characteristic. And third one would be the uh, prophylactic regimen that they were being put for uh, AIDS associated uh, microbiology uh, microbes. So, coming to uh, bacterial pneumonia, this is the most common infection patient with HIV. And uh, the risk, be, risk is being attenuated or increased by use of intra IV drug usage or uh, smoking. Uh, but uh, the bacterial pneumonia can occur during any course of the uh, disease, but then the, 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 the incidence would increase as your CD4 count would decrease. So, 80% of bacterial pneumonia occurs when you have a CD4 count less than 400 and you get recurrent pneumonia with a CD4 count below 200. So, the commonest uh, uh, organisms causing community for pneumonia among patients with HIV are streptococcal pneumonia. Uh, the other organisms are H. influenza, Staph aureus, and Pseudomonas. Less commonly, you can have Legionella and Rhodococcus, also Nephardia. So, Nephardia infection is pretty rare, but then when your CD4 count goes below 100, you got a 100 fold increase in uh, chance for developing Nephardia pneumonia. So, this is the CT film of a patient with. Uh, HIV patient with nocardia and pneumonia, you can see there is a modular consolidation associated with the uh, ground glass density in the background of uh, green bud pattern. Uh, so, uh, next is uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. Pneumocystis pneumonia incidence uh, have decreased due to the widespread prophylactic use of uh, pneumocystis pneumonia prophylaxis. But then uh, the incidence is common in patients with CD4 count less than 200. They do present with fever, a dry cough, worsening dyspnea, uh, usually developing over the course of few weeks. So the diagnosis is usually uh, with the bronchoscopy and bronchalveolar lavage, which has got a sensitivity of up to 90 to 98 percent. So this is a CT of a patient with the pneumocystis gerulosa pneumonia, where you can see widespread ground glass density bilaterally with areas of pneumatoceles. Mycobacterium tuberculosis and non-tubercular mycobacterial infections are common in HIV patients. Uh, we know tuberculosis is, uh, occurs due to the infection with uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis and uh, an impairment in the impurity is the highest risk factor for developing TB. So HIV is the greatest risk factor to develop TB and one third of patients with HIV infections are uh, found to be infected with this bug. So, tuberculosis is the leading cause of death in these patients, especially in low and middle income countries. And you get disseminated infection when your CD4 count goes below 200. Non tubercular mycobacterium infections are also common in HIV patients. The commonest bug is mycobacterium alien complex, usually occurring in patients with a low CD4 count of below 100. The usual clinical symptoms are fever, fatigue, weight loss, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. The other mycobacteria are mycobacteria sinope, which can cause a disseminated disease, whereas mycobacterium cancer C is usually confined to the lungs. Fungal infections other than pneumocystis gerulosa include cystoplasma, oxidiosis, blastomyces, and these are, these are being infected by exogenous exposure or due to the latent uh, POCA reactivation. Disseminated disease do occur when you have your CD4 count lower than 100. Cryptococcus neoformans infection is also common with a low CD4 count. The usual manifestation is meningitis followed by lung pneumonia, and the presentation is usually, is usually an acute presentation. Inversely vasculosis, yes, some common, but then it depends on your CD4 count. Below 100, you have a high chance for vasculosis infection. It could manifest either as airway inversely angio invasive or as an obstructive bronchial aspergillosis. So viral and parasitic infection, CMV, pneumonia is usually seen in patients 
with the silicocon below 50, you have common manifestations as retinitis and GI symptom. Thromboscopic and well uh, will be the diagnostic tool where you can see cytomegalovirus inclusion body. Parasitic infections like uh, Toxoplasma gondii and Sterporalis are common in patients with HIV. The Toxoplasma manifestation is usually primarily as seen as encephalitis, but then it is followed by lung infest infestation as pneumonia. It's commonly seen with a low CD4 count of below 100. The commonest manifestation is due to the reactivation of the leukin fossil and you would need a bronchoscopy and bronchial lavage to diagnose the disease. So in short, patients with HIV, you can divide uh, these patients based on the CD4 count as those with above 200, below 200 and below 100. Above 200, commonly you have bacteria. Below 200, it is pneumocystis with disseminated TB. And when you have a CD4 count as below as 100, there is increased chance for CMV, NTM, fungal and also parasitic infection. Now coming to the fourth group of patients, post-solar organ transplant. So the lung is the leading site of infection for lung and heart transplant. And the second commonest site after abdominal infection for liver transplant patients. Lung infections are usually uh, rare or uncommon in patients with kidney transplant. So during the first month, the commonest cause for the infection is due to the uh, complications due to surgery, hospitalization where you have nosocomial infections and also due to immune suppression. During the first six months when you receive the maximum immune suppression, opportunity infections are at the maximum. But then after the first six months, you have common community acquired pathogens and opportunity infections are seen commonly after six months in those patients who receive augmented immune suppression for rejection. Bacterial infection during the perioperative period in solid organ lung transplant, solid organ transplant patients have been marginally and largely due to the poor prolonged mechanical ventilation. So usually we see gram negative bacilli associated with the staph aureus legionella and community acquired pneumonia pathogens occur later in the course of transplant and uh, the commonest organisms are H influenza, streptococcus pneumonia and legionella. So this is the CT scan of the patient post pancreatic transplant with the legionella and you can see bilateral diffuse dense consolidations with an area of surrounded ground glass opacity. You have a nocardia infection that is uh, uh, uncommon because of the increased P PJP profile axis where you have uh, the role of sulfonamides. Uh, but then again, nocardia infection in post solid organ transplant patient do occur either asymptomatically or they can even have a subacute presentation where you see fever, dry cough, pleuritic chest pain, hemoptysis, breathlessness, or even weight loss. So, nocardial infection usually is occurring you after the first month of transplant with an extrapulmonary dissemination involving brain, skin, soft tissue in up to 30% of the patients. Tuberculosis uh, incidence is reported to be about 15% in endemic countries like India whereas it is as low as below 2% in the US and Europe. The commonest uh, cause for the tubercular infection in post-solid organ transplant patients is the reactivation of latent infection. And the medium time of infection is from transplant to up to nine months. You can see a large, um, fairly large mortality rate in these patients that is uh, not solely due to the infection as by itself, but also due to the uh, suboptimal immunosuppression resulting in graft rejection in these patients. Non-tubercular mycobacterium also occur in such patients. And this is uh, less common and occur as a late complication. And the commonest organisms are mycobacterium cancer C and mycobacterium bacterium avian complex. So this is a CT film of a patient post kidney transplant with a disseminated tuberculosis you can see widespread conglomerated nodules uh, bilaterally with a miliary pattern. Coming to viral pneumonia, cytomegalovirus is a common viral pathogen in solid organ transplant. It usually occurs due to the reactivation of latent virus, which was acquired remotely by the recipient, or it could also by transfer of the virus within the allograft. It usually occurs after first month of transplant, up to three months, 
and the incidence is highly seen in patient post liver transplant and less likely in patients with renal transplant coming to fungal pneumonia you can have fungal infection post transplant and aspergillus is the commonest bug seen in these patients with an incidence of approximately 5% in all kind of transplant invasive disease is limited to the first 6 month following transplant where you get a aggressive immunosuppression those patients who are not on prophylaxis do develop cjp pneumonia and that the, the risk period would be highest during the first, uh, second month and the 6 month post transplant other fungi other than cjp includes streptococcus mucor histoplasma coccidioides blastomyces candida infections are uncommon in uh, post transplant patient they do cause serious post transplant infection but lung infections <laughs> the lung infections if they manifest uh, they can be uh, very uh, more increase the mortality because of the bronchial and asthmatic infection pseudosporium epiosperum is a an emerging uh, bacteria uh, emerging fungi which can cause invasive pulmonary disease up to 50% of patients post transplant it can also cause cns infection endovascular involvement and widespread dissemination also now the fifth group is the patients with connective tissue, tissue disorder the patients with connective tissue disorders there are several biologics approved for these patients including anti tnf alpha drugs monoclonal antibodies like infliximab so all these drugs have a common uh, common finding that these do cause increased risk of infection so the greatest infection is seen with monoclonal antibody infliximab where you can have reactivation of the latent tb uh, also you can have legionella pneumonia usually occurring within the first 3 months patients can have uh, present with acute respiratory failure necessity uh, you know needing mechanical ventilation the diagnostic uh, test would be urine antigen along with the pcr fungal infections include histoplasmosis coccidium mycosis and blastomycosis now uh, how to go on uh, when you suspect a patient to have a respiratory infection in an immune compromised patient now once you suspect this patient to have a respiratory infection uh, you, you have the first screening tool that is a chest x ray now if your chest x ray appears normal you can go for a, a tlco or even a 6 minute walk test If the six-minute walk test and TLC are normal, you can observe the patient. Whereas these tests are abnormal. Along with, uh, you would need a split of microbiological confirmation. Now, if your chest X-ray is uh, focally abnormal, where you see patchy infiltrates, a focal infiltrates, and if the presentation is acute, then you can treat the patient empirically with the cross-sectional antibiotics and wait for the response. Now, if the presentation is subacute, you would need a split of examination to see confirm the microbiological pathogen involved. and also when the acute presentation fails to improve with your broad spectrum antibiotics you should need definitely need a microbiological confirmation with an invasive procedure like a bronchoscopy and a bronchoalveolar lavage <coughs> where needed you would need a transbronchial lung biopsy so based on the microbiological confirmation you can go for the treatment and if your invasive procedure is negative or you don't isolate any pathogen then you can treat continue to treat the patient empirically and wait for the response of the patient So, if the radiological lesions or the clinical status don't improve, you can again consider repeating your bronchoscopy to get a repeat sample, or even consider an open lung biopsy. So, in short, you need to have a good clinical uh, clinical support with the bacteriological support incorporated into your radiological information. So, patients. exposures and the nature of the host immune defects influence the pattern of pulmonary infection in patients with immune compromised status you can have multiple process occurring at the same time like dual infection with bacterial and fungal infection sequential infections can also occur early imaging is very important but because when you have a normal chest x ray you can consider getting a ct scan because subtle changes or even a fine modular lesions or ground glass densities may be missed on a screening chest x ray So this radiographical information should be definitely be confirmed or supported with a microbiological diagnosis, and wherever necessary, you would you should go for invasive procedures like biopsies and <coughs> bronchoalveolar lavage to confirm the microbiological diagnosis. Also, there should be emphasis on antimicrobial antimicrobial susceptibility testing along with immunohistology and molecular assays. 
Empirical microbicidal therapy should be started as soon as possible when you suspect the patient to have an ongoing infection. And this therapy should be mainly based on epidemiological history, microbiological data, and also previous course of antimicrobial agents. A reduction of the overall level of immune suppression may at times be needed to control the infection. So the take home message, your lung is the major target of infection or other complications for all patients with immune compromised status. The manifestations of infection in these patients do remain subtle or non-specific and with a progressive course, early diagnosis remains a difficult and challenging. So a clear incorporation of the clinical data into the radiological information should be supported by microbiological confirmation at the earliest. The therapeutic option should aim at hitting the most susceptible but at the earliest. So early prophylaxis, improved care and improved defense should definitely decline the infectious incidence in immune compromised patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aji. Thank you for that very excellent talk. And we are privileged. As you said, you went through the cellular immunity, the humoral immunity, the, neuro, uh, the, the neutrophil deficiency, and about patients with splenectomy. Then you went ahead and you described different organisms which affect these particular divisions of immunodeficiencies. Then you went to different types of diseases which lead on to immunodeficiencies. And of course, you went through the algorithm of investigations. That's just a question that I would have to ask you. Can you speak of any special tests that would be helpful when you are dealing with a patient who has got uh, immunodeficiency with the lung infiltrations? So you can definitely go for the invasive tests like bronchoscopy and bronchialveolar lavage, but then at times these invasive tests may, may not be maybe contraindicated or even not be feasible. In such cases, you can go for non-invasive tests like uh, to rule out any uh, an ongoing invasive aspergillosis. You can go for your serum galactomenin. Uh, you can serially monitor the galactomenin levels twice weekly, and if you find a level of uh, more than 0.5. Uh, in, especially in uh, neutropenic patients with an absolute neutrophil count uh, below 100, and that should be taken as a positive marker. The other test would be uh, uh, to a uh, sepsis marker, procalcitonin. Uh, procalcitonin, uh, high procalcitonin would indicate an ongoing bacterial infection as the uh, procalcitonin levels uh, could remain low or negative in uh, viral infection. And also procalcitonin may be helpful if suppose you have a graft versus host reaction too. Definitely. You, are, you see infiltrates on the lung. And if you do a procalcitonin, perhaps yeah. it tell you that it is not an infection. It's yeah. probably due to a graft versus host or host versus graft reaction. Yeah. Now, what about DNA samples? You yeah. can take DNA the circulating DNAs. Uh, if they are raised in uh, the, the donor derived DNAs in transplant patients or the recipient derived uh, DNAs in uh, uh, stem cell transplant patients, if they are also raised, you can again differentiate between a rejection and graft versus post disease. Yeah. What about ELISA tests that you would want to use? ELISA tests are also reliable, especially uh, in patients with uh, CMV. We can go for these tests to uh, pick up the bug earlier. Good. Thank you. Is there any question from the floor? And does anyone want to ask any special questions? If there is no major burning question, then I hand the uh, program back to Dr. Prakash Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm sure all of the people who have logged in have been treated with an extremely very good academic feast by the Department of Pulmonology. We are very grateful for the talk by Dr. Aji and the modera moderation and his valuable inputs by Dr. Luke, sir. We thank all of you who have joined in.
hope to see you all next wednesday for the 96th national webinar thank you